friends, Uncle Marv here with another episode of the IT Business Podcast, your podcast for IT business support. If you are an IT professional in any capacity, solo tech, MSP, system administrator, or you support any of those businesses, this is the podcast for you. We share product stories and tips all in an effort to help you do your jobs better, smarter, and faster. Today, I am joined by another friend in the industry, and we're going to talk shop pretty much. And my guest today is Chris Mraz from Your IT. Chris, how are you? Doing good, Uncle Mark. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, We were chatting right before we came on the air that it's actually been quite a while since we met, and we've never met in person. It's crazy. That came pretty common during COVID, but to, to think that it's been that long since we've known each other and been in peer groups and help each other and still never met in person. It's pretty wild. Yep. Uh, But we will be able to do that this weekend. I am recording this the week before the ASCII event in Dallas, the last one of the year. And once I finish with that event, I will be traveling up to Oklahoma city where you live. We're going to show you all the great fun that is on the plains here in Oklahoma city. So Pack your Speedo, pack your cowboy hat. It's going to be a fun time. <laughs> Speedo and cowboy hat. Okay. <laughs> that that makes for a good meme, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so let me do this real quick, Chris, because this is technically the first podcast that I've recorded since Hurricane Ian came through the state of Florida. I just want to give everybody a quick update. Of course, Fort Lauderdale, where I am at, was pretty much spared. South Florida, all in all, was spared. However, the East Coast, when you talk about Fort Myers, Cape Coral, uh, right through the middle of the state, all the way up through Orlando, south of Orlando, uh, was not. And I'm sure by now you have seen the pictures and heard the news stories. There is a mess over there, and it is going to take them some time to clean up. I will share more about that at a later podcast, but right now uh, we should just simply focus on getting help to them as much as possible. I would encourage people, if you are in the state of Florida, not to drive over and try to look. Uh, If you are not there to help, don't go. They are devastated enough. And if you would like to support the cleanup efforts, uh, you can go to floridadisaster.org or redcross.org, and both of those are legitimate places to give a donation, uh, floridadisaster.org, created by the state of Florida, and of course the Red Cross doing charitable work for many, many years. What I would also encourage you to do is not to support somebody's GoFundMe unless you either know that person or know the person that they are doing it for. This is uh, this is Florida, folks, so we are going to have idiots that will try to take advantage of situations, and I guess uh, one of our governmental leaders said it best, this is a Second Amendment state, so if you show up to loot, you, you might be shot. So that's what's happening here in Florida, so... Uh, Chris, I'm sorry to dump that news on you, but, um, that's, that's what happens down here. Now you guys, you guys have hurricanes or not, I mean, tornadoes and stuff up there, right? We do, you know, but they never, they never cause the the devastation that that you guys see It's significantly smaller scale uh, than when we have something like that. So uh, no, I appreciate sharing ways that people can help. All right. So let's get into the business of tech here. So you and I met some years ago. Uh, at the time, we were both on the, let's see, it was SolarWinds at the time. Uh, I think it was just after one of their name changes, right? It could, yeah, that could have even been back as far as GFI Max. I don't know. I think they had just changed. I think when I started talking with them, they were GFI, but when I actually signed up, they were SolarWinds. And at the time, so there was a few of us that kind of had met and started, uh, you guys had a peer group mm-hmm. that... I forget who actually asked me to join. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was Matt in Texas. So maybe Sean, Sean Scott, mm-hmm. our good friend there. Um, and we joined and we kind of, you know, chatted for a while, maybe 
what, a year or two? <laughs> and then it started to fall apart. Uh, but that was a good group. Um, basically, a group of techs. Now, it was an informal peer group, not you know, not something that we had to contribute to or had any sort of, you know, stuff that we were obligated to do for each other. But just um, on a weekly basis or a couple of times a month, we get together and share stories and tips and ask questions. So... Uh, let me ask you, how have things been since then, since we haven't had that peer group in a while? Uh, how are things going? Yeah, it's good. You know, so I think uh, like so many other people, we switched off of uh, that particular pat- platform over to, to Autotask and Datto. <clears throat> um, you know, that that particular group, and if, if, if anyone listening has never been part of a peer group or isn't currently part of a peer group, find one and join one. Um, they're incredibly beneficial. Uh, a lot of times as a business owner, you get stuck in your lane uh, and you have blinders on and you forget that there's other stuff out there. And so having people to call you out or having other ideas that you can hear about is, uh, is priceless. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm part, I'm part of a peer group now through uh, the tech tribe. And um, I know that a few, a few of us, Marvin, that were, together back in the day, still message and chat every now and then. So, um, you know, it's one of those things, whether it's a, a paid mastermind group or a peer group through a vendor that you're with, they are incredibly helpful as you're looking to grow your business and make sure that you don't just get kind of stuck in the same spot. So let me ask this because ours was informal. So there was never really an agenda. Basically somebody the day of would say, Hey, let's talk about this. Yeah. Now, without giving away the secret sauce to Tech Tribe, what are some of the things <laughs> that uh, what are some of the things that you guys are doing in the Tech Tribe, and what makes it so beneficial to you to be a part of that group? Yeah, so my my group's the wrong one to ask. <laughs> uh, we 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 were we were one of the first ones. We were kind of one of the the, the trial trial ones um, that helped create the actual agenda. But we don't we don't follow the, uh, the the actual way that we're supposed to. So we're. Am I going to get you in trouble? Is that what you're saying? No, no. It's just I, I can't tell you, you know, if you if you are a member of the tech tribe or you're thinking of joining for the peer groups, I can't tell you what it's like to okay. follow the All actual right. the actual process there because uh, we we don't really do that. Um, but I mean the the idea is you know you find people who are similar enough to where you're at that they can relate to what you're going through, but it's, you also want to have people who are further down the road than you are um, so that you can kind of, if you're only with people who have, who are exactly where you are, I have found in my opinion, you're not stretched or challenged um, versus if you're able to have conversations with people who are twice your size, they can tell you I've been there. Here's how I got past that. Here's something you might want to consider and that's not always necessarily how it's going to be in your everyday peer group, but um, you know, you mentioned you're going to ask and they're going to have, I imagine some kind of breakout sessions. There's going to be tons of networking, which before I went to an ask given, I thought was kind of a joke, but it's not, it's, it's a huge part. Um, and you'll sit down and have lunch and chat with people, Just kind of challenge yourself. Hey, you know, where's the, we're this size or we're struggling with this. It sounds like you've maybe dealt with that. What are some ways? So even if it's like an informal conversation or, um, I don't think ASCII does uh, any kind of conference rooms or peer groups at the events, but um, if you get a chance to join something like that, they're huge. So your normal peer group, which is, you know, your go-to-go weekly, uh, bi-weekly, though I have to say fortnightly because a lot of a lot of my colleagues are in Australia and I'm told that bi-weekly confuses them because they don't know if it's twice a week or every other week. Um, so whether whether it's weekly or fortnightly, um, you know, that same group of people you can rely on who get to know you that you can trust is uh, just that's a massive benefit. All right. Yeah. So ASCII, so they don't do breakout sessions at their success summits, but they do uh, have um, these peer groups and they've actually created a new program that is more geared towards matching up. Uh, techs and MSPs and companies that are, they will do a similar size, but it's kind of a group, you know, they may give a range, like say up to 500 grand for one group. 
and then 500 to a million or something. So you're going to find a little bit of diversity within those groups. I don't know the full dynamics. I, I've not, uh, I got signed up for a group and our first meeting is actually the week that, I, or actually tomorrow when I'm going to be in Dallas. So I'm, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> so interesting there. Well, thank you for that. But let me now go back and ask. So we talked just over a year ago last and I had asked you a couple of questions about your stack and, and stuff like that. So maybe go back and tell us what has changed in the last year. Do you have anything significant that has happened? Uh, you know, the biggest thing is I think like so many other MSPs and service providers trying, we're, we're all trying to find that for lack of a better term, the, the, the advanced cybersecurity component for our offering. Um, you know, where there's, there's a full SOC monitoring, there's, you know, isolation, there's you know, all the fancy blink DRs that you want to put out there. Um, and that we're, we're going through that as well, trying to figure out who it is that we want to use. That's going to be the best offering for the industries we serve. Um, but then also how do we price that? How do we market it? How do we sell it to our current customers that who need it? lead with that going forward. So, you know, our primary stuff hasn't changed uh, significantly. It's just really now, how do we, how do we bring that on? And how do we go back to clients and say, Hey, we've got this new security thing. Our security we have is good, but I want to say this, this extra one, because it's not good enough. You know, that that's a, I, in my head, that's going to be interesting conversations. So that's what we've been working through the past, um, oh, I guess three to six months as we look to launch that soon. All right. So have you picked a vendor yet that you're using? So the leading one right now, um, we're looking at uh, Black Point. Okay, um, they seem to to be very good. I was able to to have uh, quite a few quite a bit of time with them recently. Uh, they have a good team around them. Um, they've got a good you know good kind of mission. A good um, they really want to help and serve the channel. And, and in my head, all of the vendors. There's no way to tell how good they are until there's a massive incident. Right. And so I don't know of anyone that's gone through a massive incident. Um, however, when you talk to them, you know, they can tell you how much they've stopped or if they've ever had any of their customers hit. And um, you know, so far, the few that we've talked to seem to really know what they're doing. Uh, and they were one that now the, the Kasei, the Kasei incident that happened several months ago, uh, it seems like they were kind of at the forefront of, of helping to identify that along with some other people. Um, but yeah. Is, are there any that you've heard about that are, that are great kind of in that, that field? Well, I was going to ask you about um, education because part of my choice was to provide my clients with an ongoing educational aspect, as well as do the, you know, the fishing simulations and stuff like that. So I'm right now, uh, using two platforms. So I'm using Defendify and CyberGuard 360. Now there's some, there's some overlap because they, they both do education. Uh, and what I'm testing really is how effective their phishing simulations are between the two. They both also have an employee awareness program. The pricing structure is much different. So while that may be a factor, yeah. Um, I think the ability to see which one is more effective, but then there's also things that each of them bring that the other doesn't. So if, if, if I can price it right, I may just keep both and, and go with that. Yeah. Well, tell me this, cause education is a key part. We've, we've offered education for a while. I think we use the PII protect. I think they're com- it's a competitor to the cyber guard. Um, here's what I have found. And I don't know, maybe you've identified a way to overcome this. We've offered it for a number of years for annual annual security training. We can do, you know, the monthly training. We can do the phishing tests. No one seems to care. Customers don't seem to care. Um, the, number of cust- the number of customers who have put their employees through it, I can count three fingers. So we're offering education. We know education is important. Have, have you seen your clients and your customers take advantage of that offering? So I'm going to basically parrot exactly what you just said. They don't care, but 
What has made them care is two of them recently went to go renew their cyber insurance. And in order to get the cyber insurance, they had to show and prove that they were doing it. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we need to do it. But of course it's, well, what's the least amount that we can do (laughs) and and still get the insurance? Which is crazy, which is crazy. Because, you know, if we were to listen to all the, the companies out there, you know, we need to be doing this stuff every single month, phishing simulations, educations, videos and stuff. And customers just don't want to do that. They'll, they'll do it for an employee onboarding or they may, I've got one that they are fine with me coming in once a year and doing a classroom style thing. They're, they're okay with that. I come in during lunch and you know, if I can keep it within, you know, an hour, you know, an hour and 15 minutes and get everything done. They'll have all their employees sign off that they were there. They love that. (laughs) But um, it's the ongoing stuff. And, you know, I think the biggest problem that I've run into is the phishing simulations where the programs that if they click on something, there shouldn't, and then it sends them off to remediation school. Yeah. They're like, I don't have time for that. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you may not get, you may not get your insurance if you don't make time for it. That seems to be the only thing that's working. That's interesting. I, I hadn't heard or thought of that yet. I knew a lot of the other components for the insurance. Um, I'll be curious just to, to see what kind of feedback um, listeners give and, and hopefully there's some other ways. I mean, it's it really, it's like everything else. We can offer, we can promote, we can educate. Um, but it's the same things in our lives. Um, how many people don't wear seat belts or don't wear helmets when they ride motorcycles. We, you know, we know the risks, but we don't always follow the, the guidelines. Um, I think it's interesting that we've never been able to, to encourage people enough to, to take those, even though it's been offered for, for several years. Now, I mean, think about it. Seat belts, it's a law. Yeah. And people are still like, well, you know, if I can get away with it, I will. But that's a law. Having insurance for your car, it's a law, you know, but how many uninsured drivers are out there? It is a weird thing. And just right now, even though, you know, I'm trying not to talk about Hurricane Ian, but this is one of those situations where disaster recovery, you know, and, and simple backups, it's something where people, the, the cost of backups has gotten higher. Now, not exponentially, but for people, for instance, all my data clients are like, why am I spending so much for backup? I can get it for half price somewhere else. And then I try to go down, well, you don't have this, you don't have this, and you're giving up this, you know, is that okay with you? And, you know, there are hundreds of businesses now that, you know, haven't been open for a week. And some of them don't have any backup of their stuff. My client, um, you've probably not heard this yet, but on a recent show, I have a client that their server died. Now, granted, their server was 12 years old. I mean, it was time. And they're not a managed client. And all I could do was tell them, you know, you should really get this replaced. And I really couldn't do anything because they only called us when they needed us. And my only threat to them is there's going to be a time that you call that I can't help. And we thought it was that time when they called and said, uh, our server's not starting up, and luckily, even though the server was basically done, their drives were still good. I can grab their data, and they went through the process of getting a new server, and I told them, I said, the condition of the new server is you're going on some sort of managed agreement. <laughs> Otherwise, you find somebody else to get you a new server. Now, it was ridiculous because basically, I know that they don't call me. It's just a little, I don't even know what they're designation is they're not a retail store. They're not even officially an online store. They are, they, they sell to a specific industry. And so they do, even though it's an online store, most of their stuff, it's not like a website that I can say, Hey, go to this site and buy this. So there's only five of them. And so I'm basically for backup and minimal support, meaning I have remote access if I need it. Yeah. I'm, it's 150 bucks a month. It's not much. It's just enough to cover the backup. And yeah. then anytime they need support, they're still going to pay like normal, but they, I mean, they were so against, 
you know, do we really have to do this? I'm like, if you want me to support you, yes. Because, you know, and, and I told them, I said, the bottom line is, look, insurance companies, they're coming after us. If yeah. something happens to you, they're going to ask you who your IT provider is, and you're going to say me. And then they're going to look at me and say, well, have you been doing this, this, and this? And they're not going to listen to the, to the answer if I say, well, the customer didn't want me to do it. Well, yeah. that's too bad. You're still responsible. That's what I told them. I said, so we've got to do something. And, oh, and they were going to, so their mail, this was, let me tell you how old the server was. It was a 2003 small business server. With exchange mail. Oh, and they were, they were actually using yes. that for their email. Oh my God. Yeah. So I made them get 365. And of course they were like, well, is the 150 include the 360? I'm like, no. <laughs> I <I'm> like, no. <laughs> no. You're paying that separate. And you're paying directly to App River because I'm not going <laughs> to. Right. Um, but it was just amazing that customers don't care until something happens. Well, I mean, if, if things are working, they're working. They don't they don't see the potential problems. They just see kind of that front facing piece. They see the emails are coming through. They see that things are working. Um, so it's it's hard. You know, there was uh, I forget where it was. Someone was asking, "How do we? You know, how do I educate a, a client that they need many services? If you don't, like you, in my experience, you can't. I mean, you can tell them some some stories and how you've helped other how you've helped other people, but if they are not wanting managed services, then you're probably not going to educate them enough that they need it Um, until it comes where their server dies and you can go in and say, Hey, now do you see the value in us keeping an eye on things and making sure things are backed up? Um, We can try to educate whether it's content marketing or however else you you do that. But I mean, if you're, if you've got a, a client, we'll just call them a cheapo client for lack of a better term, or you've got, prospect you're trying to convince in my opinion i've never seen where you can educate them to the point where they ha- suddenly have this light bulb moment and say oh my goodness marvin yes it makes perfect sense now i see i see the light let's <laughs> let's go that route tell me if i'm wrong i'd love to i'd love to see if maybe i've, I've missed something I, i'm um, sure there are people out there that'll just say just do it don't even give them a choice which in the case that i just explained i did not give them a choice you know, right. now it, it wasn't the full choice that I wanted, you know, right. uh, for their size, they needed to be, you know, between five and $700 for you know, yep. full managed services. But they, I knew they weren't going to do it, but who knows down the road, they might, if they go to get their insurance, they may be told, well, you got to do these things. I'll be there to do it. Uh, we shall see now with regards to how we package stuff now, if I remember correctly, you were doing, and, and not for everybody, if I remember correctly, but you were doing some flat flat rate service, right? In your agreements, is that how you were doing it? Yeah, we, we, we know we've got, again, just like so many people, we've kind of got the tiers and the different options. Um, you know, and it's it's interesting right now as we, as we talk to people, um, it seems like through COVID, there was an influx of, of new companies starting up. Um, which is, you know, pretty standard in in any sort of economic downturn, Um, you know, people start businesses. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of newer people coming in with lower price points um, who are maybe inexperienced or don't have the full understanding that in two years, they're going to realize they maybe price themselves too low and and aren't in a financial situation to continue the business or operate. And so as we've tried to look at those. Now, hang on, you're talking about new IT people coming into. Yeah. So, okay. so new people starting up, new people starting new IT businesses or managed services companies. Um, and so as we've been looking at marketing, the kind of that higher price, all inclusive flat rate stuff, um, you know, we've not had a ton of success. Now I know a lot of people are, um, and a lot of that has to do with my inability to properly identify and target companies with our marketing and our conversations. Um, you know, but we still have, you know, the, going back again, let's talk about education again. So those companies who know what they need and know what they're looking for, um, they typically are much more inclined to go with the higher price all inclusive package because they understand everything around it. Um, but we're still we're still providing some some lower options for customers because just as you said, there's still those companies out there who either don't see the need or in some situations really don't need you know a 
$150, a $200 endpoint plan. There's just some companies that, you know, they're fully cloud-based or whatever the case may be, they don't necessarily need that. So yeah, we tried to, we tried to, to pivot and go kind of that full all-in single price flat rate tier, but for us, it didn't, didn't work out. I wish it had, because that would have been a lot more money, but it didn't, didn't work out for us. Well, let me ask this. How many, well, you may not know this, but do you know how many competitors you might have in your area? And first of all, how big is Oklahoma City? I guess. So Oklahoma city, if you, the entire Metro is, I think a little over a million. We're the, we just, this year we became, I think the 20th biggest city in America now. Really? Um, yeah. So we're pretty big. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're just over a million in the entire Metro area. Um, and as far as competitors, if we talk about managed services companies, several dozen, if we talk about maybe just independent it service providers, then that number easily goes up to 50 plus. Um, there's, a, there's a lot who, surprisingly to me, don't have a great internet presence and are 100% just through kind of word of mouth or um, through smaller networking groups. But you no, know, there are quite a few. And that number's gone. I, I would say that number's probably doubled. No. Okay. So, so Fort Lauderdale, we're kind of sandwiched in between Miami in Palm Beach and Miami is, I don't know. So the population numbers down here, it's kind of weird because downtown Miami is only about 500,000. But if you combine Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, all of South Florida, we've got 6 million in terms of population. Wow. But the number of IT companies down here is ridiculous. There's probably, mm-hmm. there's probably 10 Within, I'm not going to say within a mile. Let me say, let me just, if, if I were to say within five miles, there's probably 50 to 75. Oh my gosh. There's a ton. Um, and that's just Fort Lauderdale. And then try to add in Miami and Palm Beach because, of course, you know, the bigger companies are, you know, trying to cover the tri county area. So they'll cover all of South Florida. There's, there's hundreds down here. And, and that's not even including, you know, the trunch slammers, for lack of a better mm. phrase. Um, yeah, no. Because right down the road, you can go drive out, and there's a sign sitting on the side of the road: "Computer repair, fifty dollars flat rate." You know, yeah. And that's what we're competing against. Yeah, yeah. I um, you know, the fun the fun part about being a business owner is constantly listening to the experts and realizing experts don't always know what they're talking about. <laughs> and the reason the reason I say that is, um, you know, as we we look at the number of competitors and how we differentiate. Um, and you've been, you've been in this business longer than I have. So how many times have you heard, heard here's how you differentiate in the, in the various ways of doing that. And um, maybe tried a few and realized there's no quick fix. There's no, there's whether you have your unique selling position or your value proposition, or, you know, you wear a red suit to every networking event, you know? Um, so, it's, it's just crazy to me as we look at the how we stand out and how we compete, whether it's through a flat rate service or whether it's through a lower price. You know, I've, never, I've never been able to really find how can we succinctly, succinctly tell prospects, hey, here's why we're different. We've got some ways we do that, that we try to do that. Um, but I'm curious, with that many people around you and – so many different options. Have you seen anything that, that really works perfectly for you in terms of a a central unified offering or any sort of value proposition, or is it just every time we talk to a a client, it's something a little different. So you've, so we've, we've not talked about this in our peer group. Um, We've not talked about marketing. I I had a note here. I was going to ask you about your content marketing and stuff. So the bottom line is for me is in the beginning, I got lucky. So I came across a consultant friend in the legal industry where she sold and trained law firms on their software. Hmm. And we happened to meet up at a client that I got through a referral, which is basically the way I get all my business. It's just a referral. So I got referred and I was in a networking group early on. So I don't want to make it sound like I just, you know, it's pure referral. 
So for the first three or four years, I was in a networking group and this law firm was referred to me. I went to go meet them. She was there and we got to talking and we decided to go have lunch. And she said, you know, I liked what you did with this client. I liked the way you did your network. Would you be willing to, you know, let me refer you to some of my other clients? And I said, sure. So I got lucky in that respect where I did become kind of her go-to person. And, you know, I, I can't say the industry because, you know, Florida probably has more lawyers than any other state besides New York and California. I mean, um, there, there's a ton down here. So I'm not a big player in the legal industry. But for those few programs that she worked with, you know, I was her guy. And then I met another consultant and became their person. And I think I've total of four legal consultants uh, down here. So it was not necessarily anything that I did to say that I was different. It was more of, listen, I'm, I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. And if I can't do it, I'm going to tell you. And we'll figure out a way to get it done, whether I got to go find somebody or refer you to somebody else. I'm you know, not going to lie to you about what I can and cannot do. And luckily enough, I've been good enough to, to keep clients and, you know, outside of the, the one client that I fired after 18 years, you know, hmm. most of my clients have been with me, you know, for sure 10 years plus, but most of them have been between that 15 and 20 year period. So I've been able to grow with them. So that has helped. So they've all been it's growing. Astounding. They've all been growing companies. And then I get referred, you know, I probably get one good referral a year that uh, has worked out. So down here, I will say it is, it is simply... All you have to do almost is show up, you know, be consistent and be honest. It, it's almost ridiculous what you have to do down here to, to be a good business. If you can do those things, you're going to be okay. Cause down here, people don't show up, you know, um, people will, you know, they might have a couple of good clients or get a couple of good paydays and then they'll disappear for a while you can't get a hold of them. That's, that's crazy. That's a lot of the the comments and calls that I would get is we can't find our IT guy. Hmm. You know, and then after I've worked with him for a couple of months, oh, he's back. And then and then <laughs> and then they're stuck with, you know, the quandary of do we stay with you? And I've had some that have gone back because they liked him or her. I mean, I don't want to say it's all, the, you know, and usually it's because they're cheaper. Um and that's probably the one thing too that uh, don't compromise on price. Right now, I can't, I can't go super high. I can't compete with some of the people that are charging, you know, the one seventy five to two hundred, you know, an hour or whatever, because the expectations are just ridiculous. Those are the customers, you know, those MSPs and those companies will try to, you know, give SLAs that are just, you know, ridiculous. One hour SLA, yeah. come on. Yeah. Yeah. But what are you doing? Um, now, you mentioned the content marketing, but is that something that you're actively doing? Are you, you know, trying to market to clients? Yeah, so we use, um, we use Paul Green of the UK. Okay, um, MSP Marketing. MSP, MSP Marketing Edge. So we, we, use, um, we use him probably for a year or two now. Um, and I find it's fantastic content. It's a, it's a well-laid-out program. We don't we don't follow every every little piece of it, um, primarily due to time. We've got a plan to to implement it all, but things get in the way. Business gets in the way. Yeah. Um, so we try to do that just to mainly remain active and have resources to provide people. Um, it's very 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 common because there's so much content that comes out. Where if we're talking to a prospect or an existing customer who says you know, I've heard about X, Y, and Z, or I've got this problem doing this. Um, it's, it's pretty common that we'll have some sort of white paper that we can, can send over to them that addresses it or educates them a little bit and, and kind of helps them through that. So um, that's been fantastic. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing that we're trying to do is exactly what you just said about having those referral partners. So we, we've been trying to reach out to some local um, industry organizations, find some there are software companies or other vendors that kind of float in the same space we do to build those partnerships up like you had early on. Um, something I was encouraged to do and didn't do when I started up and I regret it, regret it now because it takes 
several years to to let that build up to where it's bringing in quality stuff. But I see that as being the absolute best way to to gain new customers is to have that cover for old network around you. Yeah. So I'm jealous. <laughs> I will say this. So I actually spoke with, so the first consultant, I actually spoke with her a couple of times in the last week. And it was funny because she actually made the, she asked me the question. She's like, are you still looking for new business? Because it was something where I think the more you get away from that, the more people think that, oh, either you don't need the business or, you know, you're, you know, fading out of the industry. Cause you know, that happens a lot down here too, where people just, like I said, disappear you know, mm-hmm. earlier um, or the solo techs, if they can't get enough business, then they, you know, stop the business and just go work for somebody. But you don't know until you try to reach out to them and stuff. Right, yeah. And so she asked me and she goes, look, I can, you know, still provide you business. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk. That's, that's good. And the fact that she's still around after all these years and doing well. So um, I definitely, like you said earlier, for the listeners, if you're listening and, you know, you want to talk about doing a referral partner network you know, it's obviously best if you can find somebody that runs in the same circles, but if you can join a networking group and I've never been a part of BNI, but I was a part of a group called the executives of Broward and it was specific to our area. And it was very similar to BNI where we met once a week, every morning, and you were limited to one industry, you know, per group and or one person per industry in the group. And we had, I think there were at our high point, there were probably 35 of us. Wow. And now granted, because some of us, we've stayed in touch that, that group disbanded probably around 2010, maybe even earlier, but we've talked about it. The reason that group worked is because everybody in the group was hungry. I mean, everybody was out hustling for business and trying. So we were all out there trying to get business and it was a perfect, you know, combination for all of us. So you've got to find a group that is, you know, of the same mindset as you, if you want business, you got to find a group that they all want business too. They're willing to, to share leads and referrals and, and get after it. And if you've got, if you've got a group where somebody has been in it for 20 years and they're kind of set and they just go there for the breakfast, that ain't the group. Yeah. Well, tell me this, because it sounds, did you, did you continue to cultivate that relationship with those consultants? Did you get together quarterly or once a year for lunch and catch up? Or did you just kind of let that, what happened there? So for a long time we did. So, wow, this is going to turn into a whole different thing. So she was a part of a group that we kind of created our own informal local peer group and we would get together and hang out. I mean, I guess I can say she's a friend because we've done other things, you know, besides the, the work together, we, she is a part of a, I don't, I don't know how she does this, but she's, she gets like blocks of tickets for the performing arts center. So anytime that those tours come through and all the plays are coming through and, you know, she gets blocks of tickets and calls everybody and says, Hey, such and such is coming to town. Do you want tickets? You know, Peter Pan's coming, you know, um, all of those things. And so there'll be times where we go as part of that group. Um, a couple of the techs that were in the group, one of them, he and I have shared business over the years where if he needs help, I help him. If I need help, he helps me. So we've done that. The other gentleman went off to start. He's made his company pretty big. He's got several techs working for him. So obviously we don't flow in the same circles, but every now and then we kind of try to touch base. And I had them at the beginning of COVID, I had them all over to my house. Uh, We had dinner and did a podcast. Um, I've given them anytime there's uh, events in the area, the big conferences, I try to get them free tickets to say, Hey, you know, come to this event stuff. So you, you do have to work at it in that sense, but for those people that helped me along the way, yes, you just you just have to keep building and cultivating it. Had you not done that, had you not regularly met with them and developed that friendship and everything, do you think that those referrals would have stopped? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. I mean, this is how funny it was. So 
we would meet for breakfast and the, the consultant, she would come in and literally, you know, once a month or, you know, every so often she'd come in with a lead and she's like, all right, whose turn is it? <laughs> and she literally would give out leads based on whose turn it was. And so the client that I fired, you know, a few years ago, they became my biggest, biggest client because of her. I supported their Fort Lauderdale office. At the time they had a Tampa office and a Orlando office, but they weren't connected. Hmm. So they had somebody support them in Orlando, somebody support them in Tampa, and they were all independent. When they finally decided to get on the same database and become one company, I got that business. Hmm. And then as they added offices, I got that business. There was another client that actually turned out to be bigger than my client that when she came in one day with the lead and she's like, oh, okay, whose turn is it? This is how sad it was. So it was my turn. But I didn't want to do business outside of a certain area. Mm. So she gave that lead to the other gentleman. Who that company turned out to be not only bigger, they are an international size company now. Oh, wow. And, I mean, he, he's loving it, too. I mean, that helped propel his business. Yeah. And it was because we were having that, that breakfast. All right. Well, that's, that's encur- that encourages me to keep pressing on and, and finding these local partners and finding a group to be a part of. I've not been a part of a networking or referral group for a long time, and I would forget the value. So thank you for reminding me. Yeah. So figure out how to do it. And, I mean, it doesn't have to be an official group. Just find somebody right. and figure out a way to, you know, keep those ties. Yeah. All right. Well, I've, I've learned my stuff. I guess that's it. I don't need to talk about anything else. I got everything I needed out of it. All right. Well, glad I could help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, well, hey, listen, we're going to be able to catch up uh, this weekend because you're going to be uh, meeting up with us when I oh, leave yeah. Dallas and head over to Oklahoma City. Yeah. So we'll catch up and uh, share some more stories. And folks, if you're listening, you're going to miss out. Or if you are going to be in Dallas for the ASCII Success Summit, the ASCII Cup, uh, reach out and let me know and we'll hook up. Um, oh, I should tell you, Chris. So um, Matt is going to be there. Yeah. I know. And oh, who's somebody else think, is coming in? I think in. Zach, Zach as well. I Zach. Believe. Yep. So Matt Foreman was on a recent show where we did uh, the Summer Tech Series, Texas style. <laughs> and Zach, Zach has never been on the show, I don't think. What's Zach's last name? Why would you try to call me out like that? <laughs> Just, I'm like, what? I would have known if he hadn't said anything. Now he's going to hate us both. He will. We're both of like jerks. That'll be on him, Callaway. though. Callaway. Callaway. Okay. I'll just say it's on him. I, I'll just say I think he's the reason we stopped meeting. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> he was always too busy for us, right? Wasn't that him? That was every meeting. He was every meeting. He was in the car. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't recall. <laughs> okay. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you drown on your own. Over the time <laughs> okay. I'll tell you how it went on Saturday. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Chris, thanks a lot for hanging out. And uh, again, we'll see you Saturday folks. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of the podcast. These are the types of discussions I think we need to be having more of. So I'm going to try to reach out and get more techs and business owners on the show. Uh, we've, We loaded up on vendors this year, so now it's time to circle back and do what we do best and talk amongst ourselves. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Chris, we'll see you then. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. We'll be back with another episode soon. I will give you updates on my trip to Dallas and Oklahoma City. Hope I make it home. But until then, holla. 